There's certain questions when we talk about faith that seem to burrow themselves in and challenge us on a consistent basis. They really make us contemplate the meaning of this journey altogether. They challenge us and, and they test us and they force us to define where we actually stand and how we feel about the totality of it all. Friends, never, ever trust an absolutist, a person who knows the definitive answer to every single question and leaves no room for interpretation. That person trusts themselves far more than they really ought to. The truth is not one-sided, is it? The truth is multifaceted, it is multidimensional, and our faith is also multidimensional. There's so many different perspectives along this journey, and I'm not convinced that if one theology is right, then all others are wrong. One of these existential questions that plagues us is all about salvation, it's all about being saved. Now, I'm sure that you've heard that term along the way. It's not something that we traditionally practice in the UCC, but it's something that we all have to wrestle with. And in this denomination, that typically happens around the time of confirmation. But there's this question that once you are saved, does that mean that you're always saved? Or can you lose salvation? Once you have it, do you have it for good, or can you lose it and have to get saved again? And it's a tough question, a tough question that maybe you haven't even thought about. But the reality is most of us find ourselves in this place of salvation as children, right? And I don't know about you when you were a child, but my mind was undeveloped. My spirit was immature. And my heart was certainly inexperienced. So is our faith really strong enough in that place to reject the world? I don't know. Is yours even now? You know, the first superheroes that I ever encountered in my life were my parents, right? Growing up, it just felt like they could do anything. Like no matter what the problem was, they could just fix it, could just make it go away. You remember that feeling? You remember running to your mom when you got a boo-boo and knowing that she could just fix it and make it all better. There's a tremendous sense of safety in that feeling. And I certainly utilized that safety net as a child. I'd get myself in these sticky situations and then I'd cry out or I'd raise my hand and let my parents rescue me. And there was a trust there. There was a faith there that was unmatched. But then I got a little bit older. And with that age came a sense of pride and maybe a little bit of arrogance. And I thought maybe I could save myself, you know? I mean, if my parents were superheroes, then that makes me like a super duper hero, <laughs> right? And so I, little by little, I, I started to rely on myself, on my own understanding, on my own experience. I'd find myself in some kind of pickle, right? And I tried to rescue myself. And just like quicksand, what happened? Well, that little bitty pickle turned into a huge, big pickle. And things just got worse and worse. And eventually, I would have to reach out to my parents. And I would need help from an even bigger mess that I entirely created. And I remember the most embarrassing feeling that I ever felt, probably in my life. You know, I was a junior in high school, and I, I had this knee surgery. And it was just supposed to be a little simple procedure and, and they got in there and everything was worse than it was supposed to be. And I woke up with this uh, 10 inch incision and all these staples and I couldn't move my leg. And, and uh, I'd never felt so much embarrassment and shame as when I had to take a bath for the first time as a junior in high school. And my parents had to help me get in the bath. It was so embarrassing, I felt so much shame, I felt no autonomy, I felt no power, no ability to take care of myself. That's a humbling experience, especially as a teenager. And that, that feeling, my friends, is what we want most when we grow up. We want autonomy, we want power, we wanna feel like we're in control. 
want to feel like we can handle all of the things that life throws at us. But we can't, can we? Not always. And certainly not alone. You know, in those moments that we lose control, when we feel powerless, when we feel like there's no hope, those are moments that we can either reach for God or we can reach for our trauma. And if we reach for God, if we surrender, it requires a certain nakedness. It requires a certain vulnerability to allow ourselves to be changed, to fully sit in that surrender. But if we reach for our pain, if we reach for our brokenness, our wounds, our trauma, we can cover up and hide. We can just fade away into the darkness and pretend like our wounds aren't even there, like everything is just fine. Like we have life figured out and we truly, well, we don't. But the only way that we begin to heal ourselves, the only way that we begin to emerge from that tomb is to allow God to shine a light in our lives. Our scripture today is a writing of Paul's from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and it says this, because of the extravagance of those revelations, and so I wouldn't get a big head, I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Satan's angel did his best to get me down. What he in fact did was push me to my knees. No danger then of walking around high and mighty. At first, I didn't think of it as a gift, and I begged God to remove it. Three times I did that, and he told me, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own weakness. And once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. You now I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. Now I take limitations in stride, and with good cheer, these limitations cut me down to size. Abuse, accidents, opposition, bad breaks, I just let Christ take over. And so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. You know, it's a comforting feeling that even Paul, even the great and mighty Paul had to conquer his pride. Even Paul had to quell his ego. Paul says that he was given the handicap of being in constant touch with his limitations. And when I think about it, my friends, I think there's a lot of us in that place. A lot of us that feel like we can't escape our shortcomings. Like however good that we are, we're just not quite good enough. And it's absolutely torture to live in that place. Or so we think it is. But it's torture because we so much desire to be in control. We so much desire to be these superheroes in our lives. We so much desire not to ever have to bend a knee and surrender. We so much desire to save ourselves. But what would happen if instead of trying to save ourselves, we just trusted God and let go? My grace is enough, it's all you need. My strength comes, to, comes into its own and your weakness. You know, we don't escape from the darkness unscathed, but we do escape transformed, renewed, restored, alive. And in the light of that transformation, we're called to center ourselves on God, to center ourselves in faith. And when we do that, we give God permission to heal us again. We give God permission to fully transform our lives. And friends, I'm not gonna lie to you. That is incredibly difficult to do, to fully surrender. It's easy to let our traditions and the way that we've always done things to let our schedules and our own ego and our pride take control. It's easy just to do things the way that we've always done them. But every time we get a new chance at life, we get a new chance at change. And God is perpetually pushing us towards change, towards evolving our minds and evolving our spirits, towards growing our minds into all that we were called to be. 
not our own perspective, but God's understanding, to transforming ourselves into faith-filled servants. Paul writes again in Galatians 5, I suspect that you would never intend this, but this is what happens. When you attempt to live by your own religious plans and projects, you are cut off from Christ. You fall out of grace. Meanwhile, we expectantly wait for a satisfying relationship with the Spirit. For in Christ, neither our most conscientious religion nor disregard of religion really amounts to anything. What matters is something far more interior, faith expressed in love. You know, love makes it easy to trust that when I fall down and I skin my knee, my mom is going to make it all better. That when I have a bad day at school, my mom can wipe my tears away. That when I fail in this life, God can remind me that I've been called to greater things. That my life is not summed up by my failures, but instead by my great successes. And no matter how far I stray off of that path that I am held in the arms of a wonderful creator, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength come to, comes into its own in your weakness. My friends, I can't tell you that you won't suffer in this life. You've experienced enough life at this point to know that you will. I can't tell you that you won't have moments where you're gripped by fear, where you can't even see what's next, because you will have those moments. But the truth is, moments pass. They just do. They're here for one moment and then they're gone. But eternity, eternity is forever. And there's a beauty in that. When you stepped into your faith, you did so with an open and honest heart fully believing and trusting in the God that walks before you. What happened? Friends, God will find you wherever you stray in this life, wherever you find yourself, even in the biggest mess that you can imagine. And God will cover you with the grace that surpasses all understanding, but only if you're willing to strip those barriers that stand between you and God. Does salvation last forever? I don't really know. But if I were going to trust anything, I would trust that faith is a living and breathing organism, that it needs to be watered and fed, that it can wither and grow weak, that it can fail, and that even sometimes, 